So everyone, welcome to the 188th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, we're counting the holiday party as a meeting, as we normally do, but uh, you know, just keep that count running. So tonight we're going to be hearing from Simo Sorce, who will be, is that close? Okay, Simo Sorce, who will be talking about identity and uh, directories with Free IPA, the open source directory service server, or suite. Um, I'd like to say uh, how much we appreciate Bloomberg allowing us to use this great space, and I'd like to thank, uh, give a thank you to everyone who's out here with us. Uh, for taking, you know, taking this opportunity and coming. And um, in addition to our space sponsor, Bloomberg, I'd like to thank our other present and past sponsors: IBM, Canonical, Brandor, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our volunteers, who, uh, you know, who contribute greatly and help us out every time uh, we come out and for everything we do. Uh, please welcome Simo Sorce with Identity and Directories with Free IPA. Uh, take it away. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here and my employer for letting me work on this wonderful project. So, what is free IPA? Fortunately, it's not free beer, but we're working on that. Um, most usually, it's a directory and authentication server, also known uh, as a domain controller, uh, except that it's, it's targeted at Linux servers rather than the regular user's desktop. IPA stands for Identity Policy and Audit, which was where the first things we concentrated on while working on this project. The project itself can be defined as a kind of meta project. It doesn't build all the components of the server, but rather glues together existing uh, proven open source components and harmonize them with some glue here and there. Uh, the goal of the project itself is to provide an identity management solution for Linux that is easy to use and install. Uh, very easy is the, is the key here. So what is identity management though? This is the dry definition from Wikipedia, which I'm going to read. Identity management describes the management of individual principles, their authentication, authorization, and privileges within or across system and enterprise boundaries with the goal of increasing security and productivity while decreasing cost, downtime, and repetitive tasks. Oh, the mouthful. Uh, for me, this is what it means, managing three basic concepts, um, identities, authentication, and access control. Uh, and when I talk about identities within Free APA, we think about equally about users, hosts, and services. These are the three types of identities we care about, and we'll see why. Um, for an identity, what, what matters is the name, their credentials, if any, and privileges that are attached to them. And in order to be able to use this identity, you need also authentication, which is the act of identifying someone to something else. Uh, Free IPA uses credentials for both users and machines and also services in order to authenticate uh, each other uh, using mutual authentication where, where possible. The end goal of all this is to do access control. The reason why you have a user, the reason why you have a password is to be able to authenticate to a system so that the system knows who you are and the system can apply the necessary access control to let you do what you are allowed to do. Uh, FreeIP implements a number of standard access control mechanisms available on <laughs> Linux machines, and on top of that, adds new stuff like house-based access control. You may ask, why should I care about the data manual? Why should I care about this stuff? And the answer is simple. Uh, we live in a fully networked environment these days. Every machine you have is connected on the network. And most machines have to talk to other machines. And in order to do that, you need accounts, you need access control, you need authentication. Uh, you need to manage all this stuff. And whether you, you are in a big enterprise or you are at home, uh, you need to manage accounts, or passwords, and all the policies. Uh, so in the Fair Play project, we think that standardizing all of this is very useful. It reduces errors. You don't have to go and build every single small component on your server configure a directory, configure authentication, and, and then forget a piece, and then another machine is not configured like the others, and simplifies also the life for the users because they have a consistent experience across all the systems. So let's get to the topic, identities and directories, why we talk about identities and directories. Um, the reason is that in most cases, identities are stored in directories, at least in big enterprise cases, uh, but I would say that you should do that at home. I do that. I have a free API server at home and I like it. Um, 
However, having the record by itself is not sufficient. A modern system includes uh, services for authentication, policies that can be distributed to the system, and a way to actually manage all this stuff in an easy way without having to know, uh, you know the, the details of the implementation of the single protocols you're going to use. Naming is also crucial, for example, when you try to connect to a, a web server, you have to know the name, especially if you're using things like HTTPS, otherwise your client cannot validate the certificate. So naming in the network is also very important. Why I'm saying all that? Because this is what a free API server does. It does all the things I described. And this is a very simple schematic of all the components we have today in a free API server. Um, we have two classes of components, what I call core and optional. They are option, the optional ones are not optional in the sense that you may or may not use them. They are optional in the sense that you may have infrastructure already take care of that, so we don't have them uh, installed in a free and regular free API server. If you don't want them, you can choose whether you use them or not. Uh, the most important one is the LDAP server. We use the 389DS LDAP server in free API. Uh, uh, comes from a legacy of uh, old code. It, it was known as a Red Hat directory server also. It comes from the Netscape directory server in the past. And it's a very capable um, multi-master uh, server. Multi-master in the sense it replicates to other servers. Um, we added a bunch of plugins to the server to uh, perform some of the operations we need uh, in IPA. And we use it as the uh, information source for all the other components. Um, so the other components are a Kerberos key distribution center, which handles most of the authentication between IPA server and between the server and the clients. Um, it, it is based on the MIT Kerberos KDC uh, standard components as well, uh, but we built in, in it uh, a new uh, KDB Kerberos database driver to let it talk to the directory server and get the information from there. Um, on top of that, uh, we have uh, an HTTP server based on Apache, Apache and Python in our case, uh, where we have the management API built. And the API is built on the Py in a Python kind of IPA framework. Um, the API serves two things. It serves the web UI and the CLI. And every command, every management interface is available through both, both the web UI and the CLI, because they both use the same API underneath. API is also available uh, to other clients. Um, and finally, core also the NTPD server uh, might seem simple, but uh, time synchronization is, is, is very important in a network, especially if you use things like Kerberos and other um, time-sensitive uh, tools. And so we install by default an NTP server that all the clients can use and keep the clock synchronized across, across the network. Uh, then there are the optional servers, uh, again optional in the sense that you may choose whether you want to use the ones included in the free API or use your own, but DNS is a very important one. We use classic bind9, uh, but we built a plugin in there that allows it to talk to the, to the LDAP server and serve the information from there. This plugin also caches some of the information for, for, for speed and also allows to have a, basically a multi-master DNS server. Uh, for People know DNS. DNS usually uses a master-slave approach where you have a single master and then multiple copies. In our case, this is multi-master because the underlying directory is multi-master. And finally, uh, last but not least, um, a complete certification authority built on the upstream doc tag project, um, also known as Red Hat Certificate Server. Um, this is a full CA. However, within IPA, we implemented some parts of it only namely the ability to give certificates for hosts. We don't do user certificates yet. Uh, all these are parts, but this is not a bag of parts. Uh, what we try to do with IPA is to build a consistent uh, layer of management on top of these parts and have them glue and work them uh, consistently together. All the functions are available through web UI or CLI, but also via API for clients that want to use APIs. So, what can I do for you? Maybe this is something you're interested in. Um, let's start from the basics, very simple stuff. Um, there are three types of identities I mentioned. Uh, users, so you can manage users, create, delete, you know, user stuff. Uh, the, the, the things that get, this gives you on top of a normal uh, user management is that you can add custom attributes if you need. Uh, um, 
it completely customizable the schema in the directory. Um, uh, so you can add things like simple things like telephone number, at real address, or even other custom objects you might need for your servers. Uh, you name it. Uh, host, uh, this is a concept that is not normally available when you use a generic LDAP server. Uh, we uh, say that we join servers to a, a, free domain, a free API domain. What it means is that we create an object in the directory that represents the servers you have in your environment, and that also allows us to give credentials to servers. The credentials are in, are in the form of a key tab that allows secure communication between the Linux servers managed by free API and free API itself. And finally, services. Services are any uh, uh, service that you have installed on your Linux servers. It could be, for example, a web server. And by giving identity to this web server, you can also give credential, again, a key tab using Kerberos, which allows you to have transparent authentication to the servers without having to enter passwords for, uh, from users. Um, in order to manage these two types of identities, we have a number of grouping mechanisms as well. So we have nested users groups. Uh, which we enroll fully in a, in a Linux server so that the Linux server sees the classic, you know, flat uh, bunch of groups for users. Uh, we have also nested hosting, uh, nested host groups, um, private user groups. Uh, when you create a user in FreeAPA, by default, we create an associated private group transparently so that uh, users' files are uh, private. And external users and groups, uh, we'll see why external. We have a way to manage external identities and bring them into IPA groups so they can be managed uh, as well. And features around these uh, grouping mechanisms. So auto membership, for example, is a very cool feature. It allows you to automatically add users or, or hosts in specific groups based on rules. So you can write a rule, and then from there on, when you add a user or a group based on their attributes, they automatically get put into groups. Uh, makes management, managing uh, machines and users very easy. Uh, legacy net groups and automatic maps, for example, is another feature we have. Uh, using standard uh, uh, LDAP protocols to, and, and, and schemas, we can distribute net groups for uh, those environments where they are still used. Um, and user self-service uh, is another uh, cool feature that allows to reduce the load on admins by allowing users to self-manage uh, some of the attributes that are on the, uh, in the directory, and so not. Ask, having to ask the admin to change information there. Uh, this is fully configured by the admin. You can choose whatever can be changed or not by the user. Policy and security. These are the features that, that I think gives you the little extra that makes free API worthwhile, worthwhile compared to a classical lab directory. Um, Hostbase access control, for example. Hostbase access control is the ability to create uh, rules that allow a group of users to access group of machines or even specific services within these machines uh, by creating a central policy that is automatically uh, retrieved by the machines. Um, same uh, for pseudo policy. We have a way to create centralized pseudo policies. So basically, you can have a trail of audit because you have normal users logging on a machine and then uh, have these machines allow users based on the policy you create centrally to whether become <coughs> full root or just be able to run specific privilege command using the pseudo binary. Um, Group-based password policy, also uh, useful. In many, uh, usually in big uh, companies, but in many big companies there are uh, um, regulations that require users to have password policies. Uh, they may be either complexity or necessary to rotate a uh, password with a certain frequency. We have the way, a way to basically build a uh, password policy for specific groups. So you can have, for example, a password policy for admin that require more complex password, but maybe it doesn't require them to rotate the password that often. And maybe you have a policy for guests that are that require easier password, but rotate them more frequently, and up to you to choose uh, which one. Uh, Two-factor authentication uh, to improve uh, even more security for, for example, admin accounts that have access to very important uh, machines and, and data, you can activate uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, these uh, can be performed via hard or soft tokens. It uses standard TOTP, OHTP, HOTP standards, so you can use whatever hardware token or soft token that uses those, these standards and uh, have specific users 
uh, use two factors to be able to, uh, to authenticate the machine. Uh, and the second factor is uh, basically a code that you get back from your token. A token is an app, uh, like for example, Google Authenticator, or we created our own app called FreeOTP uh, uh, when Google closed down the Google Authenticator source code. Um, SSH key management. Uh, so in, in FreeAPI you have users and credential and you can authenticate over SSH basically in three ways. So one is the classic password. Then the second way that we prefer to use usually is GSS API authentication. Uh, if you have a Kerberos ticket on your client, then you don't need to enter a password to log in to another Linux server managed by FreeAPI. Thanks to GSS API, the authentication is transparent. There is a single sign-on. No keys, no password, just in. However, in some cases you cannot do that. In some cases you may need to actually use a client that doesn't support GSS API or is not part of the domain. And so key management comes very handy. There are two parts to key management. One is host public keys and the other is user public key. We don't store private keys in FreeAPI in this case. So the host public key part allows you to avoid the banner that comes up every time you connect for the first time to a server or every time you reinstall the server and the SSH uh, public key changes. Uh, how we do that? Basically when you join the machine to FreeAPI or when you install it, the public key gets uploaded into the directory and the client can download it. So basically the client can prove that the public key is the right one without having to ask the user. And these avoid training the, training the user to just monkey pushing yes, 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 from that I don't care about middle, many in the middle attacks. The other one is public case for user, which is another very cool uh, thing. One of the problems of SSH key management is that people have to copy their uh, public key on every system they go to avoid putting a password in there. And what happens when your keys are compromised is that you have to rush and find all the keys, all the copies of these keys in all the systems. And this is very time confusing, time con uh, consuming, error prone. Uh, in FreeAPI, you just push your public keys in the directory and they are available on every machine. And so when the key is going to get compromised, you just upload the new one there, done. No need to chase uh, keys on, our, on every machine everywhere. Um, Role-based fine-grained delegation of administrative, administrative privileges. What does it mean? So one of the things you can do, as I said, is to manage the directory, but also delegate management of parts of the directory to other people. And you don't have to delegate all the uh, privileges. You can uh, create roles and delegate just a subset of uh, privileges to, to users. For example, you can have a DNS admin roles, role, and they can, um, can uh, manage only the DNS in there. So they are admins in the, in the directory, but only for a specific set of functionalities. So you can create a help desk role, and then maybe help desk can only reset passwords, but not create users, not change groups, uh, or, or anything else. So up to you how you want to use it. And the very good thing is that you can go all the way down to uh, change a single, a customized single attributes that these roles can touch. So it, it's very, very powerful. Um, host SSL certificate. Uh, this is an, another very cool uh, feature we have thanks to the CA, the component, the dog tag component I mentioned before. So because you have a key tab on every system that you manage to uh, join to the free API domain, uh, you already have a secret between that host and the and the server, and that allows you to basically fetch an SSL certificate for the host uh, without having uh, any authentication in between. And that allows us to automate, for example, things like renewing certificates. So if you need an SSL certificate for, the, for a specific host, you, that host can authenticate to the directory, fetch an SSL certificate, put it on the web server, for example, and then all your, user can, all your users can access that web server securely over SSL. When the certificate is near expiration, then a new one can be downloaded automatically. And you don't have you know, to remember and chase and, oh, I forgot the server X, Y, and Z had the certificate expired. Now my users get all the, oh, please have an exception because you know certificate is valid kind of thing. Uh, moreover, because we have a CA, all you need to do is to uh, store the CA certificate on, on the client systems. And every single machine will not ask you for exceptions because these are not, they are, they are not, you don't have uh, self-signed certificates anymore, but you have certificates that are uh, recognized by, by the client through the CI and CA signing them. And so you don't have all these exceptions coming out for services, um, which is also very annoying because it trains the user to basically ignore 
the fact that there may be a man in the middle attack or just a misconfiguration. Uh, secure DNS updates. So one of the things we do when we join a machine to the free API domain is that it can automatically create the, it, uh, the DNS entry. And it can, does that, it can do that by authenticating to the DNS server using the GSSDC protocol. And the DNS server will, will allow the machine to change only its own DNS uh, uh, domain name to its own IP address. So basically, you, you can let you, you can have machines that have to change IP address because maybe you install it in one place and then you move somewhere else, or maybe you have uh, machines that are served by DHCP and DHCP might change their IP address. Uh, they can automatically and, and self-change the DNS domain name in the directory and have all the clients keep reaching them because the name keeps pointing to the right IP address. And finally, SLinux user mapping for those that use SLinux, uh, not many do that, but some do. As it is a feature of having user roles, which can constrain what a user can do. Uh, in, in, if you use Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, uh, these OSs have a to enabled by default. The user, when logs in, is, co is in so-called so unconfined mode, meaning that the user is not constrained what it can do. But if you are, uh, stick a role to a user, you can constrain what it can do to the point that it can do a it cannot do anything, even if technically has access to files. And so within a free API, you can map specific users to specific roles to restrict them uh, so they can do less uh, on a machine. Simple power setup tools. So all this is nice, but one of the, fir one of the first obstacles we had when we started creating and thinking about free API was well, yes, there are a ton of things you can do, but if it is too complex to set them up, set them up, nobody is going to do them. Or maybe they will do mistakes and have a very bad experience because nothing works well. So we created uh, uh, installed tools that made it very, very simple to use this stuff. Uh, the two main tools for server are called IPA server install and IPA replica install. They have both an attendant and uh, an interactive mode. In interactive mode, they may ask very few questions like, what is the domain you want to create, uh, what is the password of the admin, and then they go on and install all the components, and by the, by the end, you have an IPA server up and running and working. Uh, and you don't have to learn everything that is to learn about every single component in order to start using it. You start first using it, and then you can go and learn about all the single components in there. When you want to install replicas, I mean, in addition to free IP servers that have the same content of the first one, use IP replica install to ask even less questions, basically just passwords, and that's it. Uh, for the client on the other side, uh, especially if you use the integrated DNS server or if you correctly configure your DNS server, IP client install will basically ask nothing but credentials to access the domain. Everything else is auto discovered from the directory, uh, so it discovers where the servers are, how to configure the systems correctly. I uh, asked the credentials only to be able to go there and join itself, so either credential, admin credentials, or even uh, if you pre-create host uh, object in directory, just a uh, one-time password, and the client is in, and by the end of the install uh, phase, everything is perfectly configured, uh, users can log in and all that. Uh, other two tools that I like very much among many IP advice tool, I try to promote this a little bit, is a, a new tool, uh, but the cool thing is that you can ask it questions about how do I configure a legacy RHEL 5 client. Uh, RHEL 5 doesn't have the very latest clients, and so you may have to configure it a little bit differently than you do for RHEL 6 or RHEL 7. So you can ask a question and it will re reply you with uh, configuration snippets or links to a documentation how to do some of these things. And finally, the IPA tool is the uh, CLI basically, and it does a bunch of things. Uh, basically, everything you can think you can do in the management is done through this tool and has auto completion and all what, whatnot. Uh, this is the tool to go for uh, people that like CLI. Scalability. Uh, of course, uh, if you have just one server, then you have a single point of failure, so you don't want to uh, put all your uh, identity and authentication information there. If that server goes away, all your network is down. So you want to be able to create replicas both for redundancy and for scalability if you have many, many, many hosts, or if you have multiple locations like branch offices or multiple data centers. Uh, so with the IPA replica installed, you can easily create another replica of the server 
and these two servers start replicating information between each other. Every, every time you change something on one server, the other server gets information and vice versa. And it's a fully multi-master setup, so you can change information on every server. Uh, on top of that, you can create a topology uh, for replication the way you think is best for you, whether you want to maximize or uh, sorry, mi minimize latency or maximize the number of links for redundancy. So you have multiple ne so networks you might create uh, different links that go through different networks. So if one of the networks go down, replication keeps flowing through the other networks. And the, the, the possibilities here are uh, open and endless. We g give some recommendation uh, through our documentation on how you, sh you sh should set up say, a topology, but uh, up to you what works best for you. And also the number of servers is, I, I wouldn't say unlimited, but you can scale up to very many servers and the only thing you have to care about is to create a topology that minimizes the latency in replication when there are so many, but that's about it. And finally, integration tools. Uh, so yeah, you might say, okay, this is very cool, but I already have my own stuff. How do I try this? How do I migrate to this one if I have already a, a big setup? We have a few uh, integration uh, tools. One is directly migration. So if you have a legacy LDAP server that just does LDAP stuff and you want to have all the new features that FreeIP gives you, we have this tool called IPA Migrate. Yes, it basically sucks all the users and groups out of your existing LDAP server and sticks them into IPA, including passwords if you have a compatible hash. And that's it. Uh, basically, you can start pointing clients from one server to the other and slowly move them and then you, you're, you're done. You have all the LDAP server out of the way. Uh, all the users and, and, and groups are in free APA. Um, legacy client compatibility. Uh, free APA uses a modern LDAP schema like RFC 237 bis and it's based on LDAP, but there are clients in uh, many places that use old uh, stuff like some even NIST and in fact uh, now it's less so but when we started a project that was a big deal a migration of from, off from NIST uh, domains to LDAP and so we have a NIST server built within the LDAP server in, in the plugin and what it does is convert the LDAP on the fly, LDAP data on the fly and serve this much, this machine. So if you have an old machine that only understands NIST you hook it up through this uh, plugin. Uh, or you have maybe Solaris machine that do not understand RFC 2307 bis, and so they need a t RFC 2307 schema. Um, okay, we have a compat tree you can enable, and then the data get converted on the fly, and when the Solaris machine asks for data, it gets it in the form it likes. Finally, uh, the, one of the most important integration tools is Active Directory integration. A lot of our customers are right at uh, tells us that they also have already an Active Directory uh, set up for the users and due to regulation many of them have either an obligation or the desire to keep managing users there because that's where they manage the user but they want to use free IPA for the service because it gives them a lot more flexibility and so we created a way to uh, bridge these two uh, directory systems uh, in two ways one is via cross forest trust and the other is via sync so what is a cross-forest trust? Yeah. Um, in a nutshell, it's just a way to create a Kerberos trust between the Active Directory domain and the free IPA domain. From the Active Directory point of view, free IPA looks just like another Active Directory forest. So when a user tries um, to, a, an Active Directory user tries to access a, a Linux machine in the free IPA domain, it just goes to its own domain controller and asks, oh, I need to access this machine. Uh, can you give me a ticket? And the Active Directory uh, KDC will just ask the FreePA server, please give me a ticket for your, for your, for your Linux uh, server in there. <coughs> and it's completely transparent to users. And if you use Kerberos, you uh, even get single sign-on. And all you need to do is run uh, a setup tool on FreePA that, uh, that basically creates a secret between Active Directory and FreePA and set up all their routing information so that the two knows which systems are where. And that's it. What are the, the, the features that are, makes it really useful? Uh, uh, besides uh, authentication through Kerberos, you have also password-based authentication, of course. So if a user that is not using Kerberos for whatever reason, uh, you just get a password prompt on the Linux machine. 
the Linux machine asks the Free API server, the Free API server bounces back to Active Directory, please uh, authorize this, done, you're logged in. All the information about the user is downloaded straight from the Active Directory side into Free API, cached on the client, and there is no real user object at that point in Free API itself. The user objects keep being managed completely in Active Directory, and authentication also is managed by Active Directory, so no password synchronization. Uh, external membership though, in Free API is, is, is one of the cool features. Even though these users are completely external, there's, there's no object in Free API, you can create this external membership into a Free API group. So all the tools that uh, I mentioned before, like host-based access control, that based on, on group authorization of groups, still works because these user, users for the, from the client point of view are part of these external groups which are nested into actual free API groups. So all the management that, uh, that is done through grouping in free API keeps working and you can do your own groups disregarding completely the groups in Active Directory if you don't care about them. Or if you care about that, you just import the whole group with the group identifier from AD and it gets nested into the free API group and it just works. And so you don't have to, to manage anything from the user point of view. You keep managing only the stuff that you care about on the, on the free IPA side. Um, and finally, one very core thing is, is POSIX ID mapping. So one of the differences between Windows and Linux is that in Windows there is a, a thing called SIDs that identify users, Why on Linux there are things like user ID and GID and the home directory and the shell. These are the core uh, piece of information you need on a Linux server to let a user log in. Uh, but often, this kind of information is not available on the Active Directory side. So we can make it up on the fly when the user comes in. There are rules you set in, in IPA, so the default shell that you give it to the user, how the home directory needs to look like, and there is an algorithmic mapping from the Active Directory seed to the user ID so that every time the user comes back, it has the same ID and it's consistent on the, on the Linux side. Or if your AD admins are comfortable with standing in the directory, there are extensions for ID to stick POSIX, identity, uh, um, POSIX uh, information in AD. In that case, you can tell Free API, you know what, don't make it up. Just go and look it up there. We trust that the AD admins are, are sticking in valid information. And so that information is, is, is pulled down. And finally, this is a very new feature, uh, ID views. We have the ability to change what is actually in the other directory. So say that they create UADs and JDs right, but they forget to put the shell in there or the home directory is never right. You can just mask some of these attributes on the Free API side, uh, side in, a, in, a, in a map that you create in the Free API uh, and change things like even the username. Say that you don't like the usernames on the Active Directory side, you can change it on the, on the Linux side and have them applied on the client. And so basically maximum flexibility to solve this problem, this big problem. The other method I mentioned is sync. Uh, in some cases, you cannot create a trust, or maybe you don't want to for whatever reason. Uh, we have a method to sync actually user and password. The, the problem is that the, now you have the same information in two directories, and so the sync becomes uh, a potential point of failure in case this object get, becomes desynchronized. You have to synchronize also passwords, and that means you need uh, an agent on every single Active Directory domain controller to capture the password when the user changes it in there. Um, we think this is a little bit uh, it's less desirable as a method compared to trust, but it's also available. Uh, it means you have to manage the user object in Free API, so when you go on your server, you have all the users that have been ever created in Active Directory, but uh, you have a choice in there. And you don't get single sign-on in this case because Kerberos cannot be used when you do the sync. Uh, Active Directory doesn't know anything uh, from that point of view of Free API, and so when users ask about access to a server, they don't get tickets or anything like that. So you, at that point, you only have password-based authentication, at least for the first hop. Once you are on the Free API side, then you can use Kerberos inside there on, on the Linux side. On the Linux side. Okay, a client. So all this is nice, but we need to also talk about how the Linux servers actually use some of this feature. And I have to remind by clients here, I don't mean users desktop necessarily. You might use uh, Linux clients, but I mean Linux servers joined to a free API domain. So clients in this case are servers that are getting their information from free API. So the official free API clients called SSSD, 
stands for System Security Services Daemon. And it replaces legacy clients like PAMLDAP and SSLDAP, PAM Kirby 5, these kind of uh, tools that you may be used to from past LDAP experiences and Kerberos experiences. Um, these old legacy clients are still fully supported because we uh, used standard schema and standard protocol. So if you want to use them or you have legacy clients where SSSD cannot be installed, they can still be used, but we prefer use SSSD because it also gives you the extra features that FreeAPA can provide. Um, another tool that we use on clients is called SetMonger, and that's a tool specific for the CA part of the, of the domain. It's a tool that is, is able to fetch certificates, keep monitoring them, renew them, and enhance all the SSL um, life cycle. So this uh, fetches the certificate, knows where it is on the file system, whether it is in the Apache directory, whether it is in the IMAP uh, server, and stick the new certificate in the right place so that the, the service can pick up the renewed certificate. So SSD uh, is the most important piece. Uh, it, it is the recommended client agent for free APA, but it's not just a free APA client. It, the project was born within FreeAPA, but it evolved as a completely uh, separate uh, and standalone uh, client that can be used for regular LDAP server, even for Active Directory domains and FreeAPA domains. Um, in fact, it can be used with all of them at the same time, because SSD has a concept of domains, and that means that you can just configure a new domain with an SSD, and you can start getting users from another entity uh, source. The only thing you have to get, take care of is that IDs don't clash, uh, and by that I mean user IDs. Uh, the names uh, is easy to handle. So this is a little schema of how SSSD works. Um, this you have two parts. One is a daemon with a number of uh, services in there, and then there are two components that st get stuck into user applications through standard interfaces. It's the same place where the PAM Kirby 5 or NSSL DAP components used to be, except that the very uh, the key advantage we have here is that instead of dragging in all the LDAP libraries, all the Kerberos libraries, and all the computation and, and calculation done within the application, we have a very, very simple uh, shim that hands all the operation to the, to the SSSD daemon. The good thing about this is, uh, is twofold. One, if these components are taking a lot of time, this time is not ascribed to the process running. So if you have C groups set up to limit the CPU, you're not eating CPU away from your application. And the second one is that because they're doing very little, there is less chance that they're going to crash the application. Because if you, if you have a very complex LDAP server and SSLDAP decides to crash, it, it drags down your application. In this case, if SSSD should have a fault, the demo will crash. The application will stay there and will just reconnect as soon as the SSSD is responsible. So this is a, was one of the key uh, points to move everything into a demo. The other one is that we can have uh, multiple domains and change the configuration of these without having to restart the, all the applications. Uh, so basically you have a few components uh, that handle the, the communication with applications, a few components that handle application with uh, free IPA domains, Active Directory, or even standard LDAP server, and then you have a cache in there. And the cache is actually a key, one of the key features of SSSD. Um, SSD does mark caching information. If someone has used an SSL DAP, they probably also use an SCD in the past. And if you're like me, you hate it. And you hate it because it's dumb. It doesn't know anything. It just tries to cache stuff, and often it gets it wrong. And it gets it wrong because it has no context. It doesn't know whether your server is online or offline. It doesn't know anything about that. It does negative caching poorly and all that. What SSC does is it has context. It knows whether the remote server is offline. And if it's offline, it will not delay it. Uh, cache the information. It keeps there, it keeps serving it to the application. When the server will come up, it will refresh it. If the user is gone, it's gone for real, but it will not make a user go away just because it cannot contact the server. Authentication can also be cached in this way, something that cannot be done by an SCD. So if you want to allow it, this is optional. Uh, SSD can store a hash of the user password, and if the machine is offline, um, network server, server under maintenance, you use it on a laptop, laptop like I do, and you don't, you're not on the network, 
SSD has a, a hash of the password. When the user enters it, it can allow the user in. It knows that the password is the same as used before. And we have a bunch of policy for expiring that information, of course, and all that. Uh, so it's very good uh, to let the ser your server keep running even when the network is not available, even when there are maintenance periods. So you don't have the traditional problem that once you stick your, your server to an LDAP server, then the network becomes kind of critical to keep the server running. Better client behavior. So one of the problems you have with the traditional SS LDAP uh, thing, for example, is that every single process runs one of them. And so unless you have an SCD or for the operations that an SCD cannot fulfill, every single process may go out on the network contact, uh, contact the LDAP server. And we had cases where we had clients with um, um, application that spawned many processes, and then each of them were, was opening a connection to the LDAP server. As so you had a single machine churn, uh, you know, chewing up 1,000 connections to a server, you can, you can see how this doesn't scale. You have hundreds of these servers. Uh, SSD has one single connection to the server, so you can do pooling, and uh, that way uh, you just have one connection from a single client. Less resources used by the server, more clients can be served by a single LDAP server. Uh, access credentials, we have a key tab that means we can authenticate from SSD to the server securely without letting every single process of the machine know the, the, the credentials because the credentials are known for a, for a separate process, uh, by a separate process on the machine. And this allows us to do authentication against the top server without revealing the password to every single user of the machine, which is also important. And finally, advanced features uh, I described, the one in free API, uh, particularly the ones that SSD serves to clients are house-based access control, neural authentication, uh, sudo, when you use sudo with the SSD plugin, um, also gives sudo the ability to work when, they are, when the machine is offline. Uh, otherwise, you can use sudo LDAP, but then you, the server needs to be always online. And for ID, we started adding some features as well, like a very limited GPO access. We can do only access control to these GPOs. We don't do all the things that GPO does, but it's a, it's a, it's a first start. So specific features for specific identity management systems. And I guess it's time for a little demo. Let me see if I can actually sh sh mirror this display. Okay, that's it. Otherwise I cannot see what I'm doing. Is this big enough? Yeah, yeah? okay. So I just want to show a little bit how the web interface uh, is so you can get a little bit familiar with it. Um, everything I'm doing Everything is able, can be done on the command line as well, except that doing it with the web UI looks better. So uh, here it is. This uh, is a user. Let's try to, to go here. Okay, let's authenticate a little bit. Okay, so this is the first thing you see when you log in in a free page server, web manager interface. I'm an admin here, and I can see a ton of stuff. Uh, more stuff, more stuff, more stuff, even more. Uh, don't get frightened. It's, it's really easy in the end. Uh, let's see what a user can do, though. So I have this user here. Uh, let me reset this password just to be sure. Is that password? Let's use FB. Now, I'm resetting the password because I want to show you what happens uh, when you first create a user when you reset this password. So, oh, why are you asking me for a new password? You just got one. This is a, a sort of a security feature that can also be disabled, but we like it. Uh, in order to avoid the admins know what is the user password, we force the users to change the password if someone else plays with it. This allows you to have a little bit more lax policies like, uh, uh, around password distribution, especially in case of help desk or user creation. You can send the password by email. It's not the best, but the user is required, is required to change it the first time he logs in. So if someone steals the password before the user gets it, the user finds out because he cannot log in anymore and will ask the admin, hey, sorry, this is not working. And hopefully the admin do a couple of checks to see what, what happened there. So we change the password. We put a very complex one called test1234. 
And amazingly, both in Free API and in Active Directory, it passes password complexity policies. Okay, and you see, oops, we have a lot less things in here. But we still see our own information, and the nice thing is that everything you see modifiable is actually modifiable on this server by the user. So one of the things uh, that I used to hate when I used LDAP servers classically was that as soon as I move from a local machine to use it in an LDAP server, as a user, I cannot change anything anymore. Most of the classic LDAP server, the admins keep them strictly controlled. If you want to change your shell, you have to ask me instead of using the classic change shell command that use, exists in Unix. With FreeAPA, you can delegate whatever you want. Uh, uh, whatever you want to allow users to do. Uh, you probably don't want to allow them to change their own username or their, UI, their, their UIDs, but initials, name, phone number, you know, mailing address, other things, maybe you want to allow that. But if you don't, let's see what you can do. As I said, there is delegation of roles, including uh, self-service permissions. So you can just go, check self-service permissions, and change the user self-service. Go here, and you say, well, you know what? I don't want you to change your shell because I'm evil. <laughs> and so, and I will set SH, not even bash. Yes. No. I will not do that. So update, uh, we'll see if the user can change it now. Uh, test, one, two, three, four. Okay, it still works. And now, oops, I cannot change my shell. This is not just in the UI. This goes all the way down to LDAP. If the user tried to do an LDAP modify on the shell, now it, it, he gets an error. Before, he was able to use even LDAP tools if he wanted to, to change it. So this is all the, way, all the way down into the directory, which is one of the key points. Every single thing we do in IPA is controlled all the way down to the directory level. The management tools are a filter to make things easier. They don't do access management by themselves. So that's it. Second thing, though, that I want to show you, something that I hope is cool. So let's say that this FooBeer user is actually an admin. Maybe we actually make it an admin. Let's see. Add admin. Yay. Now the responsibility come. Now with, with privilege comes responsibility. Uh, maybe you say, you know what? You're an admin now. You need to have two-factor authentication activated because otherwise it's too easy to get your password. Let's see what happens. Didn't you just say you're enabled to factor authentication? It didn't ask anything, right? Um, that's why, that's because the user doesn't have an OTP token yet, but he can add one, self-service. Now, this interface is a little bit more complex than I wanted to show you because I made the user an admin. Uh, uh, so, we don't need to set anything here, I think. We just say add. And, oh, interesting, QR code. So let get me my phone. Let me find my free OTP app that is free, not like, like the Google Authenticator. Let me click on this QR code thing, point it on the screen. Oh, I have a token now. Interesting. Let's see if it works. Now. Mm -hmm. Oops, no, password is not sufficient anymore. Token. Zero nine six three one three. Yep, didn't like it. <laughs> okay, I tried this a few times before. Of course, it doesn't work now.
Oh, what? Okay, so basically, you can enable two-factor authentication for any user, and he will self-provision himself. Until he self-provisions himself, he can still use the single password. Once there's a token, then you have to use it. And if you have multiple devices, you can create as many tokens as you want. You lose a device or you the token doesn't work anymore, you delete it. If you try to delete the last token, the system will complain because it would effectively allow you to go back to one factor. But beyond that, completely self-managed, which is a big help because it, it's very expensive to have a person, you know, try to do that this for a user. Go and ask the user, hey, please come here from 2,000 miles and give me your phone so I can install you a token. That doesn't really work. Okay, and I think, I think that's it for today. A few final things, uh, a little bit of future features. Um, things we are building uh, in the next free API versions that I think are really cool. Enterprise user lifecycle. This is kind of slanted to our enterprises, but uh, we had a few customers come to us and say, you know, we have an HR department that want to push this information in the directory. We cannot tell them how to create users through an interface, blah, blah, blah. We want to just LDAP access, but we don't want them to just create enabled users. So we are creating this new user lifecycle system where you can have a staging area. Users get cre created by an external system into free API. Admins check that it's all okay, add groups, add additional information to the user, boom activate the user when they want, usually when they have given them a password, because uh, before that it's, it's useless. Again, you want to delay the user, it can be put in a delayed user area, because in some co uh, companies there is there are regulations that they have to follow, where uh, if a user gets delayed and, and the user returns back two years later, they have to get back exactly the same data. And so basically by keeping this data in, in this delayed tree, you can revive it when you want it. This is kind of a big thing for some identity management uh, people. DNSSEC support. So we have a DNS server. We want to go to the next step in securing our infrastructure. We want to make sure you can actually trust the DNS replies you get. So we, are, we already have code in there, uh, experimental at this, at this moment in, 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 in master, to allow DNSSEC support. Uh, when you configure it, when you mark a zone for DNSSEC support, a key is created, automatic zone signing start to happen for all the records in the zone, and automatic key rotation also starts to happen. And this is the, the key of making DNSSEC usable, because one of the big problems is all the key management that is around DNSSEC to make it effective. The only thing that is still manual at the moment, but there are some RFCs going around to automate this, is how you exchange the key, how to set the key in the public record in the TLD, uh, but that's the only manual, manual part of it. I think this is really interesting. Uh, Epsilon Identity Provider, this is actually a spin-off project, one of many in the Free API uh, team. I started this project a year ago and it's about uh, providing a federation and web authentication when you use Free API. It is not Free API specific, you can attach to any identity uh, system but it provides you protocol like SAML, uh, OpenID for the ones who use it, OpenID Connect, Persona, whatever. Uh, some of them are already implemented, some are in phase of implementation, and this extends your reach from just basic Linux authentication to web authentication, which is kind of a big deal. Uh, password Vault. This is, I think, another very cool feature. Um, building on top of one of the components of the DuckTag upstream project, the CA, they also have a component that handles uh, encrypted passwords. We are building a way to allow users and services to store passwords in the directory. They are encrypted with a key that only the user or the service have. But the good thing is that this allows you to distribute these passwords or access them from wherever you want. So if you have a service storing passwords in there, then if you spin off 100 servers that, uh, that implement the same service, then they all can get this password from the same place. And when you ch change this password, you can get whatever you change in there. Uh, we have optional escrow as well. Um, so if you have an admin that has many privileges, including maybe access to external systems, 
you don't want to find yourself locked out if this person has an accident or leaves the company abruptly. So for some pastor vaults, there will be the ability to escrow them so that another higher privileged admin can go and retrieve all the secrets from there. The security domains, and this is the last feature I'm going to talk about. Um, again, a CA related feature. Uh, one of the things we have this CA is that all the certificates are the same at the moment. And what you want to do is to allow to have kind of scope certificates. So you want to have the certificates that are valid for VPN access to not be used for Puppet or, or vice versa. You want to have separation there. So we want to build a way to create sub-CAs so that some of the system can trust only the sub-CA and not the full uh, set of certificates that are running around in your enterprise. So if you have a data center where you give public access and you create certificates for those systems, you don't have, you, you're not in the same pot with all the certificates you use internally and, and so on and so forth. And probably user certs will also come out of this tool, so we will be able to also provide user certificates for those environments where having an actual X509 certificate for the users makes sense. So clearly, best thing since last bread. Uh, free service server is available now in Rel Centers and Fedora. They've been made, it made unstable. We tried to make this, made it into stable, but we couldn't for a bit. And Ubuntu will get it in 15.04 but there are PPAs for previous versions, so you can try there as well. The SSD clients that is available pretty much in all this has been for a few years now. It's even available in FreeBSD. I don't know with what feature set, but there you have. So, uh, before the questions, if you want to learn more, freeapa.org is the place where you want to go. You have points for, every, for everything else. Or free node, uh, free IPA and SSD channel for also for the SSD pro uh, project. Uh, if you want to try some, some of this stuff out, there is a demo site called ipademo1.freeip.org. If you go there, you have a full IPA server that is accessible. I think every night we completely reset the machine and start from scratch. So if you join machines, the next day will not work, but for, for, for a quick try, it works. The, the interface is always available. Uh, free OTP, uh, that link links you to the upstream project, but the, OT, the free OTP application is available both from uh, what I call play thing for Google and iOS, uh, except that the iOS people, uh, the Apple people made something strange in the last few days and they removed the app because they screwed up, but it will be back soon on, on, on Apple devices as well. And if you're into Docker stuff, we also have experimental Docker images. That's the page where you can find information about that in, in case you want to spin your own server easily. It's not, I would say, production level, this image, but test level, yes. So, questions? Hey, uh, so if you have questions, please come uh, to one side or the other. If it's okay, I'm going to start out with a question of my own. Um, so first question for me. Uh, I've dealt with doing Kerberos and LDAP uh, in a cloud environment. I found the interesting and challenging part is that typically your infrastructure doesn't all live under one controlled place. You end up with uh, servers in an office, uh, servers and desktops in an office. Um, you end up with home systems and laptops that run VMs that you also want to be able to access uh, the authentication infrastructure. And you also end up with, of course, everything in a cloud and perhaps behind a VPC or some other type of uh, wall beyond mm -hmm. the typical uh, single layer NAT. Um, the hard part that I found was getting, figuring out some sane way to do uh, Kerberos uh, authentication, just providing um, principal names and mm -hmm. being able to distinctly determine that uh, a, a server that was brought up under one person's uh, VM system was different than the other VM system and not having it all choke. Is there best practices for that or guides for that in, in so free IPA? The key part here is getting your naming right. The only thing that really matters for Kerberos to work is that a machine must have a name and that's it. You cannot change, or if you change, you have to change the key tab on the system. Assume you can fix a name for a machine, you're done. Now, if you have a problem accessing the Kerberos server, we have a number of things there too. Uh, so, in your case where you have you know, some machines in one environment and others in the cloud, you can do simple things like, oh well, I create a replica, so I have one server here, one server there. They're perfectly um, replicated, so it doesn't matter which server applies to you, you get valid credentials. And so that way, each system access their own local 
uh, free API server, and the only thing you have to care about is that the two free API servers can talk to each other uh, well, on all these I'm protocols, and then you open only the web port maybe to access the remote systems. I think the naming question is the most pertinent one. It's like how yeah. do you do naming in an environment where you don't necessarily control the names? Like you can provide best practices, but what are those best practices? Like if I want to bring up a VM and that VM has six servers running, how do I know that I'm not going to just call them test one through four the same way as the guy sitting next to me does when he goes home? Well, per automation scripts or whatever. Yeah. Right? Well, you need to be careful with that. I mean, there isn't much we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, from the free API perspective, when you join a machine to the, to the free API, if you try to join a machine with the same name, a Redix system, it will normally throw you an error. At least the client installer will throw you an error, and you have to force to override that. So you so get you some. Detect the error you can detect that, but you can okay. also force over it. So if you're not careful and you force because maybe you reinstall the same thing multiple times and then you start using the same name, maybe you you can get in a little bit of trouble. The DNS part is a little bit on the admin shoulder. Yet yeah, we we have we have we we help you as much as we can, but at some point you have to have some dis discipline mm -hmm. there. Yeah, it's also getting it to work with the DNS. Well, finding a way to distribute the names and to look up the names and validate yep. them. I'm curious. Uh, I'll ask you more questions afterwards. So one of the things that is different from, for example, people used to AD is that we don't constrain you to a single DNS domain name. So you can have multiple DNS domains within a free API domain, and you just tell the server, oh, I'm serving these multiple DNS zones. So every time a client asks for something in one of the other zones, if there is a host in those zones, it gets served. And if you, have, if you use a fully up-to-date client that uses the latest SSSD stuff, then this also works from the client side. If you utilize the older client, you have to maybe do some manual tweaking to tell the client, you know, this domain is also under this realm, but it is all configurable and, and it works. Okay, thanks. Um, did any of this uh, come from the Samba project? So some of these come actually from the Samba project. I didn't mention it. I actually am a Samba team member still. They haven't kicked me out, <laughs> although I haven't contributed code in a year or so. Uh, and part of this actually from the planning phase came from my experience with Samba, but all the trust part, when I talk about trust in Active Directory on the free API side, we actually run Samba and we use Samba tools to create a trust relationship. It's not a fully active directory thing. We limit what we do for various reasons, but it does use part of Samba. Okay. And in fact, we are working with the Samba team to actually finish Samba's own support for trust. Uh, Samba may, may, may now actually implement fully active directory replacement, but they don't have all the features. One of the features misses cross-forest trust support. We're working with them so that you can have as Samba server and free API server trusting each other, and you kick Microsoft out of the window completely. Oh, we have to turn that off. My bad, I should have done that. All right, the uh, AD sync uh, feature of free IPA uh, appears to only sync users and not groups. So yes, that's. Uh, let me go into the into the details there. So the way we do is, is sync is using a plugin that comes from the 390s directory server called WinSync. This plugin can actually sync both users and groups, uh, but by default in IPA we limited it to limit to sync only users because syncing groups usually is fraught with issues. Um, Synchronization of groups is, is a little bit annoying, especially because the users you can synchronize can only be in a specific subtree, and so and sometimes groups span multiple subtrees, so it become, becomes kind of messy, and in our experience, most of the people didn't really care for the ID groups. They wanted their own groups because if you're using this setup, you manage only the groups on the IPA side that, they, that you use for access control. and so we made this decision to make the thing a little bit less fragile by not syncing groups by default. Also because many Active Directory installations have a ton of groups, way too many. And so it becomes really messy. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I come from an environment where uh, free IPA is actually something that you know, we could use on Linux side, but uh, all the 
it, it, all the user uh, authentication is done on the Windows side already. All the uh, user authentication in this environment is already done on the Windows side, including uh, access that's being granted or denied by membership to groups. Mm -hmm. So having that sync uh, capability would actually be a huge help. So two, two answers there. One is if you can use trust, you should think about it, uh, because then group membership can be transferred there. Uh, otherwise, you can come on the free API channel and we see if we can enable the group support, because it is there, it's just disabled. And I don't promise you that we will you know, tell you that this is a supported configuration, even from the upstream side, but we can think about that. I mean, we haven't had enough requests for that so far, and that's why it's still disabled, but technically the support is still there. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> um, so I think to follow up from David's question, you were basically saying that um, free IPA cannot currently serve actual uh, Active Directory, right? It can't replace yeah. an AD so no, like, a, like a SOM before can. Right. So you cannot use free APA as an active direct replacement for users' desktops. It doesn't work that way. Um, you, the trust feature will allow, doesn't yet, for technical reasons, will allow you to actually log in uh, a user from free APA into an active directory desktop. But free APA itself does not work as a domain controller for Windows machines. Uh, and that's deliberate. Uh, because it was too complex when we started the project. Samba 4 AD was not there yet, and we really didn't care for bending all we wanted to do to the way Active Directory does it. Some things we do differently on purpose, either to simplify or to better suit Linux servers, because we care about the service. And so there is there are some semantic differences between Windows and Linux, and we want to we wanted to be able to. Uh, make Linux the first citizen in there, not have to bend the way it works to semantics come from the Windows world. Um, and so the problem is that the schema is so different than Windows clients, even though they can technically use Kerberos authentication, they wouldn't be able to find information from, from the tree, from the LDAP tree, and so we don't do that. We tell people, if you really have many Windows clients, you want to use an Active Directory server or Samba as Active Directory because then you have GPOs, which is the native tool used to configure Windows clients. You have all the tools that are already built for that. Um, to tell you the truth, it's actually not the Windows clients. What it is is um, Active Directory is kind of a, a target, that uh, uh, a pseudo standard. So if you have like an embedded system, like say I have a building control lighting system, let's say I have um, you know a storage array block yeah. device, they're going to have, I'd like to centralize that authentication, can I use um, uh, a free IPA. Can I use the if I don't if I can't use AD? Can I use the uh, the straight up LDAP functionality or the straight up Kerberos? So functionality? in my experience, most of these systems will say you oh build for Active Directory and they will work just fine with free IPA. Some of them have some issues. We identified some of them we can fix. For example, Active Directory have a slightly non-standard way to do simple auth on LDAP where you can just use the username instead of the DN, and we have a ticket open to implement this non-standard way. It's Oh, that, uh, that's the binding to the LDAP with the right. username, right? Yeah, okay. That's that's kind of a tricky one. Actually, yeah. one tiny little last thing. Because you said on an Active Directory in the compatibility mode, you would need a little wedge that that does the password and communicates it to Free IPA. Yeah. I assume that means that Free IPA isn't compatible with the Active Directory hashes. Uh, no, and that's the problem. Um, the problem is that we we don't have access to the Active Directory hashes, so we need this agent on the directory, on the Active Directory domain controller on each and every of them, or at least all of them where users can change passwords, to capture the clear text password before it's hashed. And then it's transferred using an SSL channel securely to free API, but still it's a kind of annoying thing because you have to remember to install it on every domain controller, and Windows admins don't like that very much, and, and so on. We'll speak. Uh, one one. Let's do one one. Uh, can I use Free IPA for file-based access control? So uh, on Windows, I have NTFS permissions, and can I like I have my Free IPA security principle? Yep. Can I on some server say it can't touch this file or can only only has read or write permissions? So, I, that... so you set permissions on the files, right. and everything follows. What I, what, what Free IPA provides you, just like Windows uh, AD provides you, is the identities, meaning UIDs and JDs, POSIX groups and then your file server will respect the permissions that you set on them. Uh, so what you can do is you have NFS servers, 
The cool thing is that you already have a Kerberos infrastructure, so you can use NFS V4 with Kerberos authentication, which means that your access is uh, per user, and you don't have to trust the whole NFS server to tell you who the user is. Uh, so y there are advantages of using it, but the access control device, uh, the file system level is always managed by the file system itself by setting this user's UID and JID numbers in the permissions. But of course, the, the, the UID and JID numbers are set into free APA. So from that follows that if you have many clients, they all have the same IDs, so they can all communicate and access remote file systems and have proper you know, access control applied. As, as far as the capabilities of managing SSL certificates, is it possible to manage SSL certificates that are signed by public CAs? So we have the option uh, to, if you have enough money to buy a CA certificate, and then basically you can use that CA certificate signed by a public CA in IPA. Otherwise, you just don't want to use a CA uh, because if you have to go and and fast certificates from a public uh, certification authority. You have to use their own protocols, and there is no real automatic protocol that is standardized. So in that case, what you can do is just you know, ignore the CA and free APA, just take certificates from them. It's not easy to have anything automated beyond that. I mean, I, I was thinking in terms of it being like a, a vault mm -hmm. for the certificates, so then you're rolling web servers, it could hand the web server, here's your keys. Yeah, I think you, you will be able to do that with the password vault, vault feature that is coming. Uh, that's one of the use cases, storing certificates, actually the private key, which is the most important part, the public certificate, you can always be retrieved. Uh, but the public, you can stick the public key into the vault, and then you give access to the vault to only the servers that need access to it, and then you can have it. Uh, useful, for example, if you want to share the same certificate be between multiple servers because they're serving the same name, basically. Yeah, that's the way I would do it in this case, but it, it's not fully automated, no. It's not so so the, the password vault isn't just for users' information? No, you it's can, for users and services. With yeah. Groups of machines yeah. and yeah. whatnot. And yeah, and there is an API that you can access for services, or we will have a way probably in time uh, to have SSSD pool specific information from password vault as well. Thank you. Okay. Hey, I'm interested uh, in hearing a bit more about the uh, kind of the reasons you chose the components that uh, that you did in when to embed into free IPA. For example, 389. Why not open LDAP? What's that? Why not open up that? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, I was waiting for this question. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not dogmatic. I'm genuinely Yeah, yeah, curious. no. It's, it's a good question, and it's partly historic. Mm -hmm. When we started this project in 2007, we put on the table two servers. One was 390S, at the time still called just Red Hat Directory Server, and I worked for Red Hat, so we had that on the table. Um, not because in Red Hat we necessarily have to, you know, use our own stuff, but we had a bunch of developers available that knew the whole thing. And we have opened up on the other side. And we actually looked just at the features, and one of the things 390S had, opened up did not have, but the two things were very important to us. One was a multi-master replication. There was no multi-master replication in opened up. There were no clear plans. There, have been, there, had, there had been a lot of talking in open that mailing list, but no code for a few years already back then. And we really wanted multi-master. Uh, so that was one of the key reasons. The second one was the, that directory server can be completely configured through LDAP commands. In 2007, open LDAP still had only a file-based configuration. And that would mean that we that was too limiting to ask because a number of tools we use like IPA replica install actually use administrative privileges to change the configuration in the other in, in the remote server and having to change a file is much more complex and error prone than doing an adapt modify. So these were actually the real two 
initial reasons why we went with 390S. Uh, and plus we had three, four developers dedicated to us, so that was a little plus. Right. For the record, I don't mind that choice. I work with OpenLDAP and found it a huge pain, so. I think it's great, <laughs> it's great. Uh, in some things. I think it's very fast. Uh, in fact, we are actually thinking of taking the LDAP, uh, the OpenLDAP built LMDB and use it to replace our aging BDB that's underneath 390S, which is like a little bit of pain sometimes, especially since the license change from Oracle. And so, yes, um, actually from my point of view, as much as we could, we can use from OpenLDAP, the better. If not, not many know that actually some of the code in 390S is OpenLDAP libraries. So the, the libraries built from open that project, we use them within our 390s. So 390s is kind of Frankenstein in there, if you want, because we use some of the LDAP drivers from the open LDAP project. And if some other people may have the question, why MIT Kerberos instead of Heimdall? Mm -hmm. Similar reasons. Thank you. I think I saw on one of the slides, may have missed it, you're talking about uh, SE Linux policies? Yeah. In the, uh, directory as well? SC Linux user maps. So we do not distribute the whole policy. I, we think that that falls under configuration management, which we do not purposefully do in IPA. We do only security policies. So SC Linux user maps are a way to tell what kind of user is logged in into the system. So going to details, SC Linux has roles, although not many people know it, and that means not only you have rules on how to access something, those rules may differ based on what is the role of the user. So if the user is unconfined, he can probably do pretty much anything a normal user can do. But if a user is set to the role of guest, as Linux-wise, then he will not be able to run any um, set with binary, for example, things like that. He will not be able to access most of proc and other things like that. So basically it's a way to reduce uh, the ability of the user to perform actions on the system. And this is a feature used in some, you know, very security sensitive environments rather than the common, but it is there and was easy to add and allows you to basically assign different levels to different uh, users. It's mostly a government feature. Cool, thanks. Hi, could you talk a little bit about um, versions and upgrading and how much maintenance is involved in that? Yeah, um, so we try very hard to make upgrades smooth. Um, so when you have a version, let's see, in RHEL 6, for example, we have version 3.3. In RHEL 7, we have version 4. Well, we'll make sure that, A, you can join RHEL 7 server to RHEL 6 and then migrate basically server slowly to roll 7 and have the full version. And when the next version comes out, you'll be able to do the same. Within the same server, we also handle automatically upgrades from one version to the other. When you install the new version, uh, there is an you know, IPL DAP update script that runs and install that changes whatever needs to be changes and uh, changing the directory. And then we rely on replication to replicate these changes out. Um, and we also try, try to be very conservative in what we change in the directory tree in order to allow multiple server versions to kind of work. However, we do advise people to try to stick to one version on all day server. Keep versions mismatched to the upgrade phase and try to make it quick because you know, queuing the whole matrix is not always simple and bugs can creep there if you keep, try to keep them for a long time. Uh, to try to improve on this situation, we're actually working on a, on a way to make versioning even more uh, easy to handle, especially in uh, activating new features. We are working on many features, and some of them require some changes in the directory. And so we are starting to implement a way to have sort of domain levels. And so when you will install a future server, unless all the servers are, are at a compatible level, you will not be able to switch this domain level. Uh, once all the server are able to handle the same feature, you will be able to switch the, the domain level and have new features enabled automatically across the system. This is in the implementation phase. So far, we really haven't, we really didn't need it. And we have been reasonably good at not breaking uh, 
systems to our brain. Uh, although, you know, bugs can always happen, we try to catch as many as we can upstream and within Red Hat with additional QA we do before releases. Um, you know, so far, so good, I think. Uh, this way. Um, you mentioned, so you're, you're running a, bi a bind nine authoritative server and you mentioned DNSSEC, so you're probably aware there's a standard to publish uh, certificates or certificate uh, fingerprints called Dane in DNS, yep. and likewise one that not many people know about for SSH called SSHFP, where you can put your public keys. We actually do already SSHFP, although you it's not signed. But once DNSSEC will be enabled, those will also be signed. Oh, okay, so FP is already supported, and then yeah. I assume that probably Dane eventually, no, probably not many people will use it until DNSSEC is like, you know, fully... Uh, Our DNS. hope is that people will start using it, although it will take time because... But we want to start having people being able to use it, even if just internally. One of the things we want to do is also to be able to pin your zone keys and eventually distribute them through the directory so if someone is trying to attack you at the government level, in the sense that they try to change the keys in the TLD, your own clients at least, for the others, nothing you can do, but for your own clients, you will detect, oh, this key has changed and the directory disagrees. So something's up. So why don't we have you guys be the last two questions and then we'll move on to the, the giveaways. Can all parts of free IPA be used under CentOS without a license? Uh, uh, so, free IPA is called Identity Management Server in RHEL, and it's available in RHEL, in the base RHEL, without an additional, any additional subscription, and that means it's available in CentOS. So, you just grab CentOS, install the IPA server package, and it's there. Okay, so the whole thing could be set up if one wanted to do it under CentOS without Absolutely. a Red Hat license. Without any license, yep. Okay. Yep. And in, free, in Fedora as well, if you like Fedora. I mean, I use in Fedora as well, it's fully available. So, but if you want something that has a little bit more longevity, yeah, CentOS is, is a good choice. I actually use CentOS myself. Oh. And last one. Uh, I remember reading the documentation that says that um, there's bi-directional sync between free IPA and Active Directory. I just was a little confused by the diagram. It seems like the canonical source was Active Directory. Yeah, I mean, if you do some changes on the users once they've been synced to free IPA, those changes can be synced back. And you can, but by default, we do not sync back new users to ID. And that's something you can enable in the plugin, but by default, we only sync new users from ID back to free API. Then if you change your password, or if you change some of the property of the users, those properties that are part of a strict set of attributes that the plugin will allow you to sync, they can be synced back to ID. Okay, so so if we if we have a sync set up and we only um, ingest changes into free IPA, that will flow into active. Yeah, for example, if you disable a user in free IPA because the uh, either because you actively disable it or because the user failed to authenticate x number of times based on the password policy, then that disablement is synced back to AD and the user is disabled AD as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and one more quick one. Do you, do you offer um, replication filtering between your between the replicas, the free IPA replicas? No, we don't do that. Yes, we don't have a read-only domain controller, and we don't have a sub portion of, of the domain controller. The replication is full. Um, we are looking into allowing so-called branch office replicas that have some filtering, but it's a complex problem. We didn't. We haven't had enough request or offer for help implement it upstream. So um, it is something we'll probably look into if there's enough demand, uh, but not in the immediate future. Thank you. You're welcome.